everybody at One Life, and I want to start uh, today by wishing everybody a very, very heartfelt and sincere Merry Christmas uh, at our East Campus, our West Campus, and uh, Henderson. I hope it's a fantastic holiday, and I'm hoping today's services really do contribute to that. You know, I was thinking uh, about Christmas, got a lot of memories, uh, but the church that I um, came from originally and worked at before I did One Life uh, used to do the Tri-State's largest Christmas pageant, essentially. Uh, it was called the Living Christmas. Christmas tree. Many of you may be familiar with it. Uh, and it, it was just that. There was a the choir that got up in this large tree and there was a bunch of lights on it. We had a full orchestra. They had live animals. I remember uh, a, a, full, a horse, run, uh, not running, but walking a, a sleigh through the, uh, through the sanctuary and other live animals, sheep and stuff and lions, tigers and bears. That's not really true, but, uh, uh, but it was just this great big deal. And, and we had a live nativity scene, all right? And so, uh, it, and, and it peaked out uh, at about 10,000 people from around the tri-state come to see this thing every year. Uh, but over time, it ran over, 20, uh, over 25 years, I think it was. And it was kind of, as it was starting to shrink a little bit in, in attendance, we were trying to think of some ways to kind of brush it up a little bit. And believe it or not, I was put in charge of it, at least for one year, uh, just because, also believe this or not, I was the young, edgy guy that they were hoping to kind of bring in some <laughs> newness and things. So I took it one year, and one of the things I decided to do is I did um, put in the production a nativity scene, and this was the one I chose. It was literally this one, I, and, and I thought it was great. I, I did this illustration thing, but I didn't have a live one. I had this, and again, I, I thought it was great. I thought it was brilliant, brilliant idea. Um, well, I learned a lesson uh, that year that if people are used to having manger scenes that are live, uh, this it was a pretty poor replacement, and they kind of let me know that. There was what I would call uh, you know, uh, uh, righteous indignation is probably a good word for it. Uh, not to mention people uh, really harass me for calling it nativity instead of nativity. No, that's not true either. But uh, I have found out, did you know this, that that's a controversy. Uh, we, we decided to throw it out for a vote this past week. Is it nativity or is it nativity? I've decided it's nativity. This is what I'm going to call it from now on, okay? And so, uh, but anyway, that's one of those things that's out there. You, you just learn stuff every day. So I did this. As a matter of fact, I, maybe you remember this. This was about 10 years ago. We had uh, just... The Tri-State got more snow in this December than it, it had since like the 1920s, and it happened during the performances of this one I was in charge of, and we had to cancel some performances, and I got notes from people that said, see, even God doesn't like that production that you put on. Uh, uh, point well taken, and in case you're wondering if I'm offended, don't worry about it, right? So I, I want to use this occasion, and I brought this in to show you this for a number of reasons. One of them is I want to go on record to say that I am not anti-nutivity scene. I'm not, I'm, not, uh, I'm, I'm not at all. And so, uh, and also, I'm not even uh, anti-live uh, nativity scene. But, as a matter of fact, what, these, uh, what, what they do is they communicate something and in a way that I think is beautiful and wonderful and cool. Let me kind of illustrate what I mean by that. Look at this image. I'm going to show you this image and... Um, Identify what that stands for. It's pretty easy. You don't have to yell it out, but uh, that's, that's Mickey. That stands for Mickey. That stands for Disney. Now, what's really, really fascinating about that is it's three circles. It's, it's, it's really nothing, but you and I can look at it. We can know it's Mickey. We can know it's Disney. It informs us. We have that much in our culture. Well, I want to show you um, another image, and it kind of functions the same exact way. Look at this. Yeah, the manger scene, the nativity scene, uh, it, it, it has the same effect. It's such a part of our culture, such a part of who we are, that as soon as we see just a very simple version of it, we know what it is. That's how Christianized, if you will, our culture is here in America. And that's pretty cool. I think that's a great thing. But on the flip side, it can also be kind of a bad thing, too. Now, as soon as I say that, I, I, let me, I'm, I'm, don't panic. 
I'm not about to go into a rant about how we need to put, we need to get back to the real meaning of Christmas. I, I don't want to do that. I think that's been done. But what I would like to do is I, I hope to awaken us to the meaning we derive from Christmas. Let me say that again. I, I, I'm not going to go on a rant about how we need to put the meaning back in Christmas and get back to Christmas's original meaning. What I'm hoping to do is awaken us, maybe just a little bit, to the meaning we derive from Christmas. And what I mean by that is, what you may not know, is this simple little image that's become kind of quaint, kind of a cartoon, kind of a cute little thing, is actually informed, and all that it stands for, it's informed with so much meaning, and it's rooted in so much meaning, that it's actually revolutionized the world and provides the fabric on which our country and Western civilization is built upon. And this is being noticed. That's why we said at Christmas, everything changed. I want you to hear this in some ways, but to kind of launch us out, I want to recommend um, a Christmas gift in case you're wondering for that certain something, uh, that special something for someone out there. We offer this book in all of our sites out in our Re uh, Explorer library. It's called, uh, uh, it's called Atheist Delusions. Now, unfortunately, Atheist Delusions is not really directly about atheism. It's about the major, major impact that Christianity, everything that this image represents, how it revolutionized the world. There's another book we offer, by the way. If you want one that's a little, uh, a little easier to read, it's called uh, Who Is This Man? by a guy named John Ortberg. Both of them kind of have similar themes, but I would highly recommend one way or the other, depending on your reading level, the kind of things you like to read. But I'm going to be quoting, I want to give you kind of a block quote from the writer of Atheist Delusions and what he says about this image, everything it meant, and how it impacted our culture. Listen to this, quote, My ambition in writing is to call attention to the peculiar and radical nature of the new faith, Christianity, in its original setting. I want to point out how enormous a transformation of thought, sensibility, culture, morality, and spiritual imagination Christianity constituted in the age of pagan Rome. The liberation it offered from fatalism, cosmic despair, and the terror of belief in occult agencies. Also, and we're going to pick up on this one, so watch this sentence. Also, the immense dignity it conferred upon the human person. Its ability to create moral community where none had existed before. And its elevation of active charity among all other virtues. My argument is, first of all, that among all the many great transitions that have marked the evolution of Western civilization, there has been only one, the triumph of Christianity, that can be called in the fullest sense a revolution. Now, I know that's kind of put in scholarly ease, but let me just kind of sum it up this way. This cartoon, cute, quaint little image and everything it stands for was absolutely revolutionary in the ancient world, and it impacts yours and my world every single day. And beliefs and ways we look at the world came from what this stood for. Now, there's lots of different examples I can give of that. And basically what I want to do today is I'm going to give you just, we're going to deal with this, this subject from just a couple of different angles. I'm going to give you uh, kind of a, an idea that I want you to remember and that we're going to focus on the rest of our time together, and they're these. Listen to this. This Christianity, the manger scene, the whole deal. Jesus ensured people are valuable and God is approachable. Now, we could talk about Jesus' impact on the arts, on the sciences, on health care, on women's rights, and all that. Get those books to get this. But here's what I want to do today. I want you to remember this. Always remember. Jesus ensured people are valuable and God is approachable. Jesus ensured people are valuable and God is approachable. That's what this did in the world in ways that we take for granted. Now, let's, let's look at the first part of that. Jesus ensured that people are valuable. That is something that Western civilization is built on in ways that we often take for granted. 
The United States, in its founding documents, it was written down, we said in the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident that what? All men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among them life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, right? We say that in our founding documents. We live on that. We count on that. We believe that all men are created equal. Did you know that's not always been thought of? As a matter of fact, throughout the ages, people have debated whether people are equal or not, and people are superior or not. What led to the Civil War was an argument over that basic thing. One of the most interesting reads I ever had was I, I, I looked at the, the, the debate documents from the North and the South during the slavery debate. I remember a Southern aristocrat. I was reading his argument for slavery, and he actually kind of made fun of Thomas Jefferson for even saying that. He basically said, what do you, what do you mean it's self-evident that all men are created equal? That's not self-evident at all. Obviously, some men are superior. Obviously, some people are inferior. We can tell that by looking around. And you know what this story does? You know what this portrait bring? Was a grounding for the thought that all men are created equal. You need to know that uh, there's an uh, agnostic philosopher named uh, Luke Ferry. He said this way, quote, the Christian idea of human equality was unprecedented at the time and one to which our world owes its entire democratic inheritance. That's just a philosopher saying, okay, what you have to understand is this image brought this idea of all of us are created equal. Jesus ensured the value of all people. Now, how did, how did this work? Now, and almost where this image comes from and where this uh, it comes from a story that's just as familiar. It's found in Luke chapter 2, and we're going to read the Christmas story, and I know many of you are familiar with it, but that's the point. Let's listen to it with new ears, and what we're going to do is we're going to lift out these ideas of how it gives us meaning. It says this, listen, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to, be, to register. So, Joseph also went up to the town of Nazareth in Galilee, to Judea, to Bethlehem, to the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. Now, while they were there, the, tame, the time came for the baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth. Peace to those on whom his favor rests. We read that story. We've heard that story. We've heard Linus do that story in the Peanuts cartoon. And we create nativity scenes as a result, right? And what happens? But what's going on here was actually subversive and revolutionary to the people that, originally, that the story was originally told to. Here's why. Because back then, they had a very hierarchical system of looking at all of the universe. Whenever they looked up in the heavens, they, they, they believed that there were gods. And the gods, some gods were superior to other gods. And then just under the gods, you had the king. And the king was the only person in a culture who was allowed to be thought of as created in the image of God. And that's the, that's the kind of language that they used. Under the king were his court, then there were priests, then there were merchants, then there were artists, and on down it went, and then there were peasants, and then there were slaves and the dregs of society. And they looked at all of reality that way. Well, you know what the summary of this story is and this image is? It says the Lord, the Lord 
is in a manger. And he's born to peasants. And it's announced to shepherds. And we don't think much of it. But it says the glory of God was around shepherds. You know, shepherds were kind of in our society. It would be like a, a, the glory of God appearing in a heavenly announcement being given to migrant workers out in a field somewhere. They had no, they were perceived as having no social status, no ultimate value. This kind of announcement was for kings. This kind of announcement was for people that were valued, right? What this story does, having a Lord in a manger, Born to peasants, announced to shepherds. What it does is it takes that hierarchy ladder and literally flips it over on the other side and says that all people have value. God is calling all, all the people are included in this. You see, we have, and Christianity has taught since this moment when it was a radical revolutionary idea and now it's a normal idea that we're, we just kind of take for granted that every human life has what we would call a conferred value. Now that's important for some reasons. A couple of reasons. First of all, I'm going to call it cultural. Right now in our culture, I don't know if you know this or not, have noticed, you probably have as you really think about it, the debate goes on. Laced throughout history, that debate is going on. Do, do human beings really have a conferred status or do they have an earned status? The Bible insists it's conferred. It's something that's placed on you by God, that just by virtue of the fact that you are a human being, no matter where you are on that social scale, you have value and dignity, and you're crowned with that. But that's being questioned. Let me give you an example. Um, I, um, Bill Nye, the science guy, uh, gave a speech at Oklahoma State University, and he had a quote, and he said this, and you've heard things like this probably. Quote, I'm a speck, and he's talking about the scale of the universe. I'm a speck. Standing on a speck, orbiting a speck, with a bunch of other specks in the middle of specklessness. And then, forgive me, but he, he, there's a quote, he says, I suck. That was his, kind of what he communicated to these young college students. I suck. Why? Because the scale of the universe is so big. Now, here's the problem. If you remove this, you start getting thoughts like that. And guess what? There's not a huge distance between a scholar saying, I suck, and him saying, you suck, based on that same reasoning. And what's happening in our culture is this becomes increasingly quaint, cute, cartoonish, and little else. We start losing the basis that we have for fundamental human dignity and value. Now that comes out in some pretty disturbing forms. Did you know it's being debated at the highest levels in Ivy League schools, in ethics places where, 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 where people are starting to speculate, well, what if, what if a child is severely handicapped or something like that? Some are arguing that the parents should have the right to determine personhood, to determine value as they kind of watch things go and even could be given permission to commit infanticide if they so choose, if they confer value. And according to the Christian view of the world, it radically revolutionized everything by saying, no, value comes from God. You may have heard this story. It's, it's been on billboards. I've seen it around. But uh, Rick Hoyt, Rick Hoyt was a, uh, young, he was born, he, as he was being born, he, the umbilical cord got around his neck, cut off some oxygen to his brain, and he was severely brain damaged and body damaged and everything else. And, and he, was, he was thought to be basically not functioning at all. They finally figured out a way, medical people gave him a mechanism when he was around 11 years old, that he could, he could tap out messages bumping up against something with his head. And he was watching TV once, and he, he saw that there, was a, that there was a race going on for charity. And he tapped out his message to his dad, Dad, I want us to run in that race. I want to run in that race. And the dad, valuing him, said, okay, we'll try. And he was a self-described. He just said, I, I'm kind of a porker. I've never ran any, I, I've never ran more than a mile in my life. What am I going to do here? So, but he, okay, he settled up. And, and he went there and he ran the charity race and he came back and, and then little Rick tapped out a message and he said this, and it was words that changed his dad's life forever. Dad, 
when I run, I don't feel handicapped anymore. And so this team, and they call themselves Team Hoyt. There's a picture. And I love the it's a good life. They run, and they've run in countless marathons and even triathlons around the world. I think they're entering retirement now. But listen what Dick Hoyt, his dad, said, quote, uh, to ABC News. He said, quote, when Rick was born, they said, forget him. Put him away. Put him in an institution. He's going to be nothing but a vegetable for the rest of his life. And here he is. He's 52 years old. And by the way, he graduated high school and college. And we haven't figured out what kind of vegetable he is yet. <laughs> Where does that come from? It's conferring on Rick and anyone else. Because you are a human being, you have value, period. It's not something you earn. It's not something you have to work towards. It's not something that other human beings can determine about you. It exists because God says it exists. And this image says, God, the Lord, became a baby. He was born to peasants. He was announced to shepherds. That means all up and down the socioeconomic line, you have value. Now, that's, that's the cultural application. That kind of discussion is going on. Let me give a personal application. We talked a couple weeks ago. We pointed out that in the Bible, the Bible maintains that all of us as human beings, one of our characteristics is we are worshipers. We're worshipers. We have to worship something. In other words, we look for things out there to give us value, to give us significance, to make our lives feel worth living, if you will. And that rightful place where we're supposed to person we're supposed to put up there is, is God supposed to give us that. But our problem is we're constantly looking for other things to give us that value, to give us that worth. And it could be any number of things. And I was thinking about that. And we asked some kind of hard questions a couple weeks ago about that. Among them, where do you get your sense of significance? Where do you get your sense of worth? I was asking myself that question and I uncovered about myself. I get too much of it. I'm tempted to get too much of that worth from success in church work. But you know what I also noticed about myself, and I don't think I'm alone on this? Because I'm in America, I get my worth from how many digits are in my yearly salary figures. If you go from five to six figures, huh, you're somebody. If you go from six figures to seven figures, you're really somebody. Sometimes we determine our value by the square footage of our house or what part of town we live in. We determine our value by what the title that's on front of our name or the, the degree that's on the back of our name. Now, there, please don't get me wrong. There's, there's enormous value. There, those things have value. They're good. They're not inherently wrong of, in and of themselves. When you look to those things, though, as your place and your giver of value, That's where you've gotten where you're worshiping the wrong thing. As a matter of fact, we suffer from this so bad in, in the United States. Sometimes we look, we look at Jesus' story. We're like, hey, he was born in a manger. But the way we would love to hear the story is that then, but then he grew up and he was an entrepreneur and he became a, a, a leader of a multi, a multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar conglomerate of businesses. He went from rags to riches. I've got good news for some of you. Jesus started in a manger, and he never really went beyond that as far as his lifestyle, who he was. When he died, they weren't separating out the company that he built or the bank account that he had from everything we know. He didn't even, maybe even had a bank account. Where do you get value from? According to this story that's become quaint, cartoonish, and cute, God, the Lord, became a baby, born to peasants, announced to shepherds. Now the good news is we also know from another place that the story did not exclude scholars and leaders, you know, the story of the magi who brought gifts. But all it's saying is, guys, it's for all people. All people. And that brings me to the second part. Jesus ensures people are valuable. But he also ensures that God is approachable. Jesus ensures that people are valuable and that God is approachable. 
What I love about this, what I love about this story is kind of the, the backstory. As we envision in our minds, some things are accurate, some things probably aren't. I, I was looking this up, and, and it said they, they had to go to the town of David. Both uh, Mary and Joseph were from a place called Nazareth, right? And so because of the census thing, they had to walk to Bethlehem. Look that up. It's about 130 miles. It would be the equivalent of r- walking a little bit past Louisville, Kentucky from here in the tri-state. I, I asked Google how, long that would, how many hours of walking that would be. It'd be 45 hours of walking. She was also nine months pregnant. That means 450 bathroom breaks along the way, right? So she's kind of going through the day of 45 hours of walking. And what happened is, now what we picture that's probably inaccurate is that they enter Bethlehem and they're kind of there late for obvious reasons. And they go around and they're looking and the Red Roof Inn doesn't have any place to stay. The Holiday Inn doesn't have any place. They finally go to the Motel 6 and even the Motel 6 is booked up. That wasn't really exactly how it happened. You see, back in that culture, they wouldn't have had the hotel kind of thing going on. They would have been gathering for a census, so they would have been going to be with family, extended family, aunts and uncles, like many of you are going to have at Christmas. Cousins running around everywhere. And they would have gathered in homes. And these homes, these are peasant homes, and they're probably about the square footage of a modern-day hotel room for everybody. Now, what's interesting is that the homes were divided in two sections. And when it says there was no room for them in the inn or there was no place for them to stay, what it means is there was a section for the people to sleep. And then it also, there was a section for where the animals would sleep. This is a agrarian society. They were taking care of their animals. They gave them shelter. They just would have had a few sheep, goats, something like that. And, but, and, and what happened was when they got there late, as they walked in, and it was just wall-to-wall people laying on the floor in the place where the people stay. And so they would have been over where the animals were, right? Can you think of a more approachable image? This little couple that kind of has to be corralled into this area where they're having to be over with the animals. And you've got the the ants, they're they're kind of fawning over the girl. And the the uncles are trying to kind of avert their eyes. And the little kids are kind of wondering what was going on. She's having a baby in there. Someone pointed out that why wouldn't they have put, you would think this family would have put, you know, the Mary over with the kids. Well, you got to remember, it also said she was pledged to be married, but she arrived pregnant, especially back then. Uh-uh. So she had to deal with that as well. But you have this family situation. You have shepherds. And these shepherds, they didn't have to have some security thing around their neck. They didn't have to punch in a code to get into a gated community. They would have come into this family setting of cousins and uncles and aunts all piled in there. And there's this baby. There's few images that cr- that are more approachable, that put you more at ease. You see, there's, there's this wild passage in the Bible that says this. It says basically, essentially, you, if you were to peel back reality and see God straight on in all of his glory and all his wonder and all his power, it says God dwells in unapproachable light. And what's going on in this story is God is saying, okay, I want you to know that I'm approachable. I want you to know that you can come in. Good news, great joy for all people, no matter where you're from, no matter what you make, no matter what you look like. I've made it where I am approachable. And it changed the image of God and ancient people would have said the gods used to be the ones that just wanted sacrifices and just and this was a Lord who was a baby in a manger born to peasants announced to shepherds. Some of you have heard this story, but uh, when we when we started One Life, uh, we were leading up to it, and on ten 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 in Henderson. Uh, a group of us got together at a place called in Henderson called Rookie's Bar and Grill. And we were hanging around, you know, I was having some food and things. And we were talking to our waitress. And she heard us talking about church and we're inviting her to church and stuff. And, and, she, and she chimed in and she said, no, I'm not doing that. And I'll tell you why. Because actually a couple of years ago, I decided I was going to go to church. I needed that in my life. And so I walked up to a church. And a woman greeted me at the door. And I happened to be wearing my rookie's t-shirt. And she said, young lady, you're not coming in here in that shirt. 
And I remember, and I'm not trying to play Mr. Righteous Guy or anything, but when you talk about the approachable God, the one who made himself, who came down as a baby, announced to shepherd the whole deal, a story like that just, ooh, just tears me up. I hate it. Because too often churches have that image. You can't come in here if you're this. You can't come in here if you're that. And so I told her, I said, listen, I'll make you a deal. I'll make you a deal. If you come on 10, 10, 10, you can not only wear your rookie shirt. Here's what I'm going to do. I'll wear a rookie shirt and I will preach in a rookie shirt. And I did. And she did as well. That's a portrait. Just a small portrait of what this image with all that it means and all that it is portrays. But guys, I don't know where you come from. I don't know if you're on the end of the wise men and the magi. You have good title. You've got a lot of figures behind your income. Or you, you're essentially off the streets and you have none of that. But what you need to know, this story and this image communicates is something that's radical not for just our culture, but radical to us as people. He's given you value. He's conferred it on you. You don't work for it. You just have it. And then he says, come. I want a relationship with you. But you know what? Even when I knew this in my life, I refused it. I want to do my thing. I want to be in charge of my life. I didn't want an approachable God. I, didn't, I wanted value that I would go out and create. I, it's just my life. I'm going to do my thing. And the more I understand about this image and the more I understand about what God was actually doing, what was the line? You remember? They announced to the shepherds, this day in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. See, the more I know about this image and I look at the years that I thumb my nose at heaven and I walked my own way, even though God went to the extent to open up his arms and say, hey, come in. I want a relationship with you. I want to live with you. I continue to straight arm it and push it away, proving all the more that I needed a Savior. There are some of you across all of our three sites, there are some of you who know the story, you, 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 know, you, you know the image, you're familiar with it, you got it. And when you really, really think about it on the deep, dark recesses of your heart, you know it's an invitation to not just live your own life, but to live a life that he wants to have with you as the creator of the universe coming down to meet you wherever you are. And yet, you've said to yourself many, many times, I just want to live my life, this is my life, I'm going to do my thing, I'm going to do my deal. And you need to hear yet again. You couldn't have a more precious and encouraging and beautiful, meaningful, amazing picture than the God of the universe who would do something like that for you and I. And I guess my challenge to you is it's time to stop. It's time to stop running. It's time to stop acting that way. It's time to st stop straight arming, straight arming heaven and open up your heart to the one who, as Lord, came to a manger, born among peasants, announced to shepherds. Open it up for anybody, no matter where you are, no matter where you're from, no matter what you look like, what you've done. You're invited in. But here's what you have to acknowledge that I'm guilty pushing it away, guilty of refusing it, and I need a Savior. So here's what we're going to do. Across all of our three sites, as soon as I kind of, I'm going to 
sign off to them and, and, and the worship teams are going to come up and they're going to play song and worship song. And, 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 and I want you to kind of apply whatever was meaningful for you during the course of this message and just Christmas and the whole thing. But I especially want to invite those of you, you know you've been consciously running. You've been consciously straight arming the whole thing. And this gracious God who's invited you into relationship is calling. And that's not going to go on just forever. At some point, he'll give you your life. And it will be the end of your life. And then all you have to look forward to is pure, raw, well-deserved judgment. But now you can cry out and you can say, okay, Lord. I want that relationship that you went to all that trouble and all that beautiful imagery to give me. Please take what Jesus did on the cross and apply it to me. And I want you to do that during this song. And here's one last thing I'd like you to do if you do that. We've come up with a way we'd really like to know and we want to help you with some next steps. Just take out your phone. It's where we all live anyway. And text to the number 62953. 62953. Just the words I in, meaning I'm in. I'm in. I finally heard it, and I'm, I'm just saying, Lord, I want that relationship that that image portrays. Now I'm going to turn it over to our campuses.